Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Service Management Leadership Podcast. I have a great guest for you. David Cannon has been with us before. He and Mark Bradley talked a, a few months ago, and I'm excited to have David back. David, how are you, sir? Well, thanks, Jeffrey. It's really good to be back with you again. Thanks, uh, thanks for inviting me back. David is one of the authors of Digital and IT Strategy and for the ITIL 4 books series or whatever you want to fill out your bookshelf with. And so he brings a different perspective. He's been an author on previous version as well, as I think, and brings this. There's a lot of us that have been in this world a long time. And, and I, I really enjoy talking to David because he brings a different perspective than my own. And so we have great conversation. David, I have a big, broad question for you to start with. <laughs> Service management is starting to look different. You know, it smells different. Sometimes it's a little more tool centric or, you know, every company is just applying it in different ways. What are some of the trends you've seen as you do your consulting, as you're out there doing your speaking? What are some of the trends you've seen? Oh, a really broad question and probably a lot of different answers. I'll, I'll try and I'll try and bring it down to some specifics of things that I've really seen really over the last six months. It's also difficult to talk about the last six months because you're also affected by, uh, you know, major pandemic. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, I have to try and sift out, you know, what is the result of people responding to a pandemic versus what are trends that are kind of, you know, came before and will continue afterwards. But uh, essentially, I think uh, probably the biggest trend, and I don't know if you can call it a trend, but the more things change, the more they stay the same. Yes. Um, and a couple of things to support that statement, you know, one is we're starting to see a trend or we have seen a trend of uh, IT service management splitting into a number of different directions. And each of those directions is being owned by somebody. Right. So, for example, we have ITSM. Now, ITSM is a, is a really broad blanket statement for how you manage IT. But somehow over the past probably five years, it's come to mean Incident, problem, and change management. Right? Yes. And then there's a second one, which is ITFM or IT financial management, which includes, uh, you know, the ability to uh, track costs, allocate them, and report on them more effectively. And that has somehow been taken over and become its own discipline in its own right. And and uh, you have ITOM now, IT operations management, which focuses on event management and that kind of thing. And that seems to be all separated off on another side. And you have IT asset management or ITAM. And that's all about life cycle and replacement cycles and licensing control and, you know, all of this kind of thing. And all of these areas seem to have gone off in, in directions and become really hyper-specialized. And, um, you know, on, on one side, that's really positive because it means people are developing really specialized skills and focusing on those areas and building them out and making them work really, really well. On the other side, you're losing the dependencies between these areas. And, uh, you know, for example, on ITFM, IT financial management, it's like it's all about, you know, how you get financial information and input it into your reporting tool and then report it back to the business. And we talk about the changing conversations you have with the business. But what's interesting is when you speak to people in ITFM, uh, it's focused all on the cost side and it doesn't focus on the return side or on the value side as much. Uh, there, there are some individuals who do that, but generally it's like, well, as long as you can quantify your cost, you're okay. No, you're absolutely not okay. You really have to be able to compare those costs with what the business uh, units are doing. So that's, that's a bunch of trends. And I, and I, you know, see that I, I would hope that they start really coming together again a bit more as they really should be. Um, you know, I hope so too. And yeah. I, I, I want to interject and I yeah. want to tell you why I think we're seeing that. And I will even add ESM enterprise service management. Y yes to that, but I think it's being driven by the tool makers because those are modules within a tool yep. suite and they, they're they driving that. And I, I, I do yeah. see that tool influence being an undercurrent to a trend. Yeah, uh, I would totally agree with you. And I, you know, I'm not gonna say whether it's a bad or good thing, no. but it is a thing, right? And, and I think um, one thing that's driven this 
is uh, if you look at all of those areas, they are really they really fit into two categories. And the the the, the first category, which is probably the biggest category, is uh, they are driven by uh, basically defining service management in terms that can be reduced to a ticket and a workflow. As long as I have a ticket and a workflow, I can use a tool to automate it. Right. Tools that do not use tickets and workflows, you know, they're not as high profile, they're not as implementable, they're not as useful. And yet, if you think about it, a huge portion of what we do in IT operations is managed with our tickets and workflows. You talk about capacity management, for example. Right. The ability to forecast to, to forecast workflows so that you can automate them in the cloud without driving your costs out of control. You can't do workload management. You can't do that, right? But workflow management is not a ticket-driven workflow. Therefore, it's not going to. You, you can't use those kind of tools for it. And so, you know, as long as we can focus on a ticket and a workflow, and even better, let let's get with it, a Kanban board, right. then uh, then you're good. No, actually, you're still only able to do about 25% of what an IT operations group should be able to do with, with those tools. So, you know, I'm, I'm seeing that kind of feeding the trend as well. And, uh, you know, tool vendors that focus on that have a much easier time of selling their product than tool vendors who focus on the aggregated management of operations. Right. So I have two things and you see me yeah. just chomping at the bit on this. <laughs> First one is I want to put CMDB in that same category to get your CMDB oh. strong. It has very little to do. It has some ticket and some workflow, but it's a lot of other things like accountability of CI class owners yeah. and things of that nature. But yeah. the other side of it is the reason we don't see C uh, CMDB is very strong in the same thing you were talking about having that holistic approach is that we somehow have bypassed the need, and I mean this, the royal we, the big we, not you and I, bypass the need to have strong people and strong process, which the tools execute. We somehow have put the tools that the people in the process execute, which seems backwards. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. And uh, focus on CMDB for a little bit. Uh, and I know this is an area of particular interest to you, but, but a trend that I have seen and this is not recent, this has happened ever since these tools came out, is the, the trend to rely on discovery or auto-discovery yes. to populate the CMDB. Um, and of course, uh, you know, again, uh, you will be told that these discovery tools will auto-identify relationships between configuration items. And they, they, they probably do. I mean, they can certainly tell where an application resides on something, or they can certainly tell where one database links to an application or another database, et cetera. They, they're pretty good at being able to determine those, those relationships. What they cannot do is tell you what those relationships actually mean in terms of business activity. Right. So if this server and this application and this database are linked and related, what specific things does that enable a business user to do? And what specific outcomes are they able to achieve when they do those things? That is something that those tools do not do. And if you want to architect a CMDB correctly, you really have to go back and start identifying those kind of business relationships. They're, they're, they're not technology relationships alone. They're not people relationships alone. They, 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 com they, you know, they combine all of that. And uh, unless you can build all you know, the full spectrum of relationships into the architecture of your CMDB, it's going to be very difficult for you to get any real value out of it. And number two, it's always going to be out of date because you're dependent on importing and cleaning data from somewhere else. Yep, it happens. In most yeah. companies that I've found, and I even had a recent LinkedIn poll, two thirds roughly are below 70, 70 78% accurate on their CMDB. And I think that number's even high. I think it's, I think the percentage of people, I would say most hover around 50% accuracy because the other, you mentioned the discoverable uh, attributes. How about the non-discoverable ones that you have to manually say that this is the CI owner this is the location. This is, you know, right. those are the hard ones to keep current because in a big organization, there's so much change. Uh, absolutely. Yet, if you're 
successful as an IT service provider, as an IT staff member, as an IT, operation, uh, IT operations leader, you actually do have to manage those relationships in real time anyway. Yes. So it's not like, oh, well, we can't do this, so we might as well not put it in the CMDB. You have to do it. You are doing it. And so it shouldn't be that hard to automate. It shouldn't be that hard to architect. And yet somehow we really struggle with this. And I, I, I think the reason for that, in, in, in my opinion, is, is really just uh, we've got a couple of building blocks that we need, you know, that we, we, we kind of assume are there already. But, but we, we, so we ignore them. And one of those fundamental building blocks is a very simple service mapping exercise mm -hmm. of, you know, here's how things fit together. And uh, we assume that was done during the development cycle. We assume that was done when we migrated the workloads into cloud, and yet they weren't. And if they were, great, but it was never communicated to the people who are actually responsible for day-to-day -day -to -day operations of those things. And so it doesn't find its way in there. And it's, it's, it's fundamental. It's always been like yes. that. It's still like that. And it's not a difficult problem to solve. It's just we assume, or we, or we keep getting told, that the tools will solve the problem for you. And they don't, because right. they don't know your business. They don't know the people. They don't know the politics. They don't know, you know, and, and you have to understand those things if you want to do those kind of mappings. So, oh, yeah. you know, so so there's a trend. There's another trend, actually. Uh, it's, it's, it's one that's um, a little concerning to me, and it's this framework bashing trend that's going around right now. It's so destructive and counterproductive, you know, and, and every time I see a blog from someone in one framework or the other saying, you know, our framework is better because we introduced this that the other framework does not address. It's, it's counterproductive. Um, you know, every framework has its value. Right. And, it, uh, and that value will vary depending on who you are and what you're trying to achieve. Um, and I think IT leaders instead of saying, well, we're going to focus on one framework and, you know, exclude everything else because that one framework meets all our needs. Um, you know, they're, they're doing their organization a disservice. An IT leader now needs to be familiar with um, all, you know, as many of the different frameworks that impact their organization as they can be. I think that IT managers should understand DevOps. I think they should understand ITIL. I think they should understand Agile. I think they should understand Lean. Uh, and and more uh, as uh, you know, depending on the kind of organization it is, but this whole thing that you know every framework has to address every problem, yeah. and they have to do it differently. It, it's nonsense. It's you know it's absolute nonsense. It's about understanding what a framework brings. It's about selecting the pieces from the different frameworks that work for your organization and and using them to best effect. Um, and the latest one I saw, and it's a bit disingenuous, the latest one I saw was, here's a great new uh, framework for incident management that covers all the things that ITIL does not cover. <laughs> and I looked at it and I said, but all of the stuff is in ITIL. And I looked a bit closer and I thought, oh, here's what's happened. They took a term out of ITIL, incident management. They said, okay, now we're going to go away and we're going to define what we mean by incident management. Right. They included a bunch of stuff. They then go back to ITIL, compare it to incident management in ITIL and say, well, ITIL is deficient. Doesn't cover these things. You know, um, but when you look at ITIL, well, it wasn't covered under incident management, it was covered under problem management. Right. Or it was covered under change management or it was covered under capacity management. And it's like, it's not that ITIL didn't cover it. It's that ITIL actually thinks about it a little bit differently. And, you know, there, there's, a, there's a way of, um, understanding that, digesting it, and using it within your organization. Great that you came up with a new framework. Fantastic. If it's helpful and, it, uh, and, and people can use it, by all means, go ahead. It's great. But please don't say, our framework is better because it includes things that are not included in the other framework. You know, right. like, come on. You know, so this trend of framework bashing, I, I mean, I, I just hope, I hope we can get over this. I'm with you. And I want to, can I use that and pile on? So one of the, one of the frequent call types of calls I get are we have agile and we want to incorporate ITIL or we have ITIL and we want to incorporate yeah. agile or DevOps. And I'm like, sure. And the one thing that we all know, and I say we, you and I, is no two organizations <laughs> are the same. Yeah. They're not the same. And you, 
you cannot compare organization to organization. You can't, you, all you can do is bring tools to try to help. And, but what I was getting at, here's a trend for you, David, and you tell me how correct I am. That more and more, and we're going to get to ITIL and the strategy piece, but mm-hmm. a lot of organizations are, are outsourcing or using external partners for their operations. And they're being, they're using heavy ITIL in change, incident, problem, all of that service requests. And then they're using agile and DevOps as their design and implement. And then, cause they use either internal staff for that or a different service provider. And now they're having conflict where, you know, you see out in the ocean where the two types of oceans, they go together and they never mix. That's how a lot of these companies have this issue where in B3, we would talk, well, that should be in your service design documentation or, right. you know, we should do that. But there's this, this lack of how do they fit together? How can, how can an organization that uses agile for their design and their, their sprints and then hand it off to operations, you know, there, people think it's an either or where really it can be an and very easily. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I you know, you're, you're right. I agree with you that this is, this is what's happening. I think, I think, you know, a better way to deal with this is to say that in the design stage, there are elements of ITIL that are important because when it goes into operations, those things have to have been designed. And I think during the operational stage, there are design things that are important that the the development teams need to understand because it helps them for incremental improvements and so on. Splitting them into, uh, well, the, the lives, the live stuff is managed by ITIL and the dev stuff is managed by DevOps or Agile or whatever, whatever else you want uh, to, to throw in there. It's not a helpful argument. Right. So it's like, you know, choose one. Uh, and if you want to use DevOps, then that's fine. Use that as your overarching framework. But then make sure you've built in the pieces from ITIL that, that, that really augment that and make sense to, uh, you know, to, to the people who are going to be using that down, downstream. Um, and, and I think you know, we've always said in ITIL, it, um, this, this is not something you implement um, out of the book. Right. Uh, the book is a guideline. You implement the processes or the practices and you use the guidelines to do that. But ultimately... What you need to end up with is your own framework for your own organization. Um, and, and, you know, again, you, you, your, your opening point was, you know, every organization is different and it's absolutely true. But what's really strange sometimes or um, humorous is the, the number of people that will say our organization is unique, but we're going to do a standard implementation of ITIL. <laughs> I'm sorry. And I, you, you, you know, those two don't fit together. Right. And it's whatever's best for your organization at this time, given your roadmap. And exactly. that's also why I, and I don't want to project this onto you, I dislike benchmarks of, you know, you should be at this maturity in change or incident because you have different stakeholders, different tools, different leadership risk profiles. You have so much different that you cannot compare one to the other even using the benchmarks because, and I, we talked CMDB, you can't even compare yeah. that because the estates yeah. look different. And uh, anyway, I just, I, I hearken back to the old quote that says, comparison is the thief of joy. And because if you are doing well, comparison just makes you gloat and you lose your momentum. And if you're doing poorly, you just give up because you're like, ah, <laughs> there's no reason comparing. Right. Right. And so, and, yeah. you know, every company has this journey that they're on and they just need to do what's best for them incrementally. Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting point. So when whenever I did or do uh, an assessment, uh, you know, people will always talk about a maturity assessment because that's the kind of language, that's the point of reference, and that's fine. The, uh, typically, they don't mean a maturity assessment. What they want to know is how do I get better from where I am right now. Um, And so what I've done in my assessments, I include uh, in the final scoring, it's just a simple Excel spreadsheet, but in the final scoring, I have a little lever in there, which says relevance. And I turn that on or off. And so I will, in the maturity assessment, say, you know, (laughs) your chargeback is is non-existent. Um, And, you know, the first thing is, oh, wow. Uh, yeah, we really suck at that and they feel all bad. And then I say, but 
you shouldn't be doing chargeback. Why are you even thinking about this? Let's just turn this off. And suddenly it goes from red to green. Right. <laughs> because I don't have to worry about this stuff. Why, why are you measuring yourself if it's something you really don't, you shouldn't be doing? Yeah. Exactly. And, and you may have an organization that wants high, you have a high risk tolerance for change. So you can right. put things in fast. You may have a low risk yeah. tolerance. You're like, oh, we're risk averse. Okay, let's put more scrutiny. But so those change success rates and speed to delivery rates may look different. And that's okay. It is. Exactly. And so anyway, let's, I have, I could, you and I could talk all, <laughs> at least I could, I could listen to you for a long time. <laughs> so one of another trend, if organizations are starting to pick up steam, sending people to, I told four foundations and mm. starting to at least think, how am I going to incorporate, I told four how am I going to do this? And so how would, how, or two questions, how are organizations doing so? And how would you advise them to do it the same or different? Well, uh, yeah. Um, how are they doing? So it's still early days, but what we're seeing is a lot of people sending people through, as you said, on foundation courses, let's see what's different. Let's see how this is really going to impact us. The interesting thing is that what we used to call processes, which are now called practices, because they weren't all processes, but right. um, the, 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 the practices are pretty consistent with version three. I mean, incident management, problem management, change management or change enablement, as it's called now, they're all still there. They all play pretty much the same kind of role within, within the overall uh, scheme of things. So an organization looking at itself in version three and saying, you know, I have these, these processes in place. I'm actually pretty experienced in doing change management, for example. What is a move from version three to version four going to mean? Probably not a whole lot. Right. Um, maybe, maybe a little bit of introduction of some techniques, uh, maybe the change of terminology here and there, maybe a little bit more automation. Uh, and to be honest, I would have thought that an organization who's been in long enough would have preempted version four in a lot of these areas. You're, you're, in fact, it's a best practice. So it's based on what people have done, right? And so many organizations did preempt ITIL four because they were in it for long enough. So I think, I think part of it is this is really just a, a, an evolution of incremental changes to many of the practices that you already have in place. However, there's a couple of things that are quite different. Uh, I say quite different. They're not actually. They've just been called out a little bit more effectively. One is the dual responsibility of service providers and customers. You know, the fact that we, we're in a relationship in which we both bear responsibility for the outcome of that relationship. As a customer, I have certain responsibilities. As a service provider, you have certain responsibilities. And it only works well when both of us are meeting those responsibilities. That's a really positive thing in, 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 in ICL 4. I, you know, and I think we try to talk about it in version three. We talked about the difference between internal and external customers, for example. We, we spoke about the fact that when you have an internal customer and you're an IT service provider and you have an, a business unit, for example, that consumes your services, that's very different than when you are selling a product to an external customer. You know, the, the, the responsibilities and the the um, um, uh, objectives are very different in those two relationships. So we, we're trying to cover that, but version four or ITIL four has really brought it out a, a lot more effectively. Um, something else that uh, ITIL four has brought out a lot more effectively is the overarching framework of managing and pulling together all these practices. Yeah. And what I really like about it is that it's called the service value system for those listening, but um, what I really like about the service value system is that previously, uh, ITIL processes were kind of, in version one, they were all in their own book. In version two, they were in groups of books. In version three, they were in a life cycle. But, but they were all kind of standalone in a way. And so what you found happening was organizations just kind of implementing one process at a time and kind of getting through it that way. And, you know, starting typically with operational processes and then moving on to some of the more tactical processes and so on. But what you have in ITIL 4 is this overarching framework which says, actually, you're going to focus on your overall organizational requirements and where is your organization going and what capabilities do you need to get there? 
And how can you use the practices to give you those capabilities or to, to coordinate those activities? And I, I think that's a piece that was, that's, that's really valuable within, uh, within four. And so again, in three, you will have seen reference to that kind of thing. You know, we spoke about, uh, you know, this, this, um, I think it was in the strategy book, we spoke about a logical organization structure in which yeah. you had the business relationship managers, the project or the program office, the, um, the steering committee and so on, all collaborating. Uh, well, you know, that, that was kind of a, a kind of grassroots led kind of thing and sort of bubbled up. What you now have is more of an enterprise view of how you manage service management. I think that's really healthy. And what that's also done is driven a little bit more focus on the strategic side of things. It's like, this is not just about you being able to keep your IT environment stable and operational and solve things when they break. This is about you identifying what kind of business opportunities exist for your organization if they use technology more wisely. Right. And, you know, that's a very different discussion. It means that the IT group, the traditional IT leader is now participating in on an equal footing with other business leaders. Whereas before we were back office service providers. Right. Now we're front office business leaders with a technology, um, you know, contribution or specialization. And, and I think ICL4 has really kind of heralded that, that shift. Now, it, I, I want to be very clear if we're going to talk about ICL, then we talk about the other frameworks as well. The other frameworks do the same thing and they focus on the same thing. And so we see, uh, we see a number of groups emerging where you have product owners within the business. And to support that product owner, you have these, these multifunction teams, which include people from IT, they include people from marketing and you know, R&D and all, you know, they're all together working and building these products. So this is not unique to ITIL in any way, right? It's, uh, it's right. certainly something that's happening across the industry. And this is, this is the ITIL component, which looks at the IT leader's point of view and says, you know, this is how you need to get involved in this. So I, you know, I, I, think, I think that's part of it. How, how are people implementing it? I think people are still exploring at this point, but I think the first stage is just to have a look at what you've got in place. Right. What, what have we done already? You know, what's working well for us and how do we extend that into more of a sort of um, cohesive framework for our organization? Especially if you, if you buy into ITIL4 and you say, and one of the guiding principles is iterate. Of course, yeah. you're going to then take, start where you are, another guiding principle, you know where you are and you move forward from there. So there are two other things in ITIL4 that I wanted to mention. And that is you see improvement or continual improvement everywhere in ITIL4. Mm -hmm. And you also see a, a heavy aspect of governance. And here's my, uh, here's my illustration. Governance keeps the train on the tracks and improvement helps propel it forward. Because whenever you stand up your you know, you transition from change management to change enablement. You need some way to propel it forward and governance keeps on the track and improvement keeps it going. And so the role of governance historically has been somewhat of a profane word, right? Everybody's like, oh yeah. no, governance. And do you think it's needed governance and how is it possibly underappreciated, so to speak? Oh, well, uh, first, uh, first answer is yes, it's needed. It's absolutely needed. I, I will say that uh, to the underappreciation point of view, I think two ways in which it's underappreciated is that when people talk about governance, the very next thing they talk about is two things. One is control. The other one is compliance. Yes. And governance is uh, those two things actually only come much later. That's right. you no know, governance. Uh, so if we're going to use the train track analogy, which is a good one, uh, governance is there to make sure you don't start building uh, train tracks through quicksand. Right. Right. It, it makes sure that if you're going to build train tracks and you're going to have your, your, your train go in a certain direction, that you, that you structure those train tracks properly. Right. Um, you know, as opposed to, hey, uh, we got to build a railway and it has to head east. Let's just pull up a compass and just keep building east no matter what. 
you know, and, 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 if, and if we have to tunnel through a mountain, then fine, instead of going around it, we'll just tunnel through it because our strategy says go east, you know, or, uh, or the opposite problem, which is, hey, we're building a train track. Oh, wouldn't it be cool to have a branch go off here and a branch go <laughs> off there? And before you know it, you have, you know, 300 branches and you're still no further east than you are going to be. And so governance is the piece that makes sure that you're headed in the right direction and that you're doing it in the right way. Um, and I think more than that, I, I think the, the whole thing about governance is governance is what communicates the purpose. You know, and Great point. when you read about leadership and you read about high performance teams, the very first thing that gets mentioned when you talk about high perform performance teams is common goals. Uh, common goals and a sense of purpose. And governance is what brings common goals and sense of purpose throughout the enterprise. It makes sure everybody's aligned. It makes sure everybody's excited about what they're doing. It makes sure that everybody knows that if they want to head off in that direction, that's cool. But that if they want to head off in that direction, you know, you're going you're gonna to have some, you're going to have some trouble, not because we said you can't, but because there's a really good reason why we don't head in that direction. And it's basically means that, you know, we could go out of business. We don't want to do that. So, Hey, uh, you know, look out for that. The other thing uh, I think that's really um, an issue with governance is that, you know, organizations have flattened and, I know, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, that's just the modern way. No, that's actually not the case. Uh, it's not the case at all. The reason why organizations flatten is because change has uh, become faster. So when, when change, is, you know, when, when, when you're in a stable environment, when nothing changes, you, you really don't need to flatten out. You don't need to distribute uh, authority. You know, you, you can pretty much have a very hierarchical organization and you can, that organization just exists to make sure everybody does their job, nothing more, nothing less. But when you're in a very fast changing environment, as we are right now, then you'll find things speed up. Decisions have to be made a lot lower down the chain. If you're talking hierarchy, what that means is, People at the so-called bottom of the chain now need to be elevated. People at the top of the chain need to kind of come down a little bit. They're, they're all closer together and decisions have to be made a lot faster. Now, that in itself, that design and that way of coordinating activities when you have a shallow organization is called governance. Yes. It, it, it's, not, it, it's not a negative thing. It's actually the thing that helps you to flatten the organization and make decisions and communicate those decisions effectively. And if it's done properly, it should not be a difficult thing, you know? And, and so you're, you're moving from rules to policies, right? Or, you know, you're moving from only the, only the top, uh, top ranking official can make decisions to the person who does the work, make the decisions. What is the control in that? And this is where the control comes in, right? Because you want to make sure that decisions are not being made inappropriately. And oh, well, people say, oh, well, that's just people wanting to be in control. No, actually, have you ever been in a situation where you've been given a job to do and been told to make a decision and you don't know what you're even talking about? <laughs> yeah, I have. I, but, have I mean, it's a horrible place to be in. Right. You know, I, I want in those situations, I want to be able to reach to somebody and say, I don't know what I'm talking about. I need help. I need, I, I need information to make this decision. And I need to know what the parameters are. What happens if I make the wrong decision? How far can I go? How much money can I spend? I need to know that. And if I don't know that, it's an awful position to be in. So, so actually, governance and control uh, can be a really, really positive thing. And, and in fact, Truly effective organizations are very well governed. Yes, um, I agree. I yeah. would. I want to pile on to what you were saying, if I can, and you tell me Absolutely. if I if I'm paraphrasing this right. Yeah. Everything that goes fast in this world, think airplanes, think uh, spaceships, think anything that goes fast, they have high governance because if you're ever around airplane facilities, they worry about every nut and bolt because to your point their purpose is safety 
they care about standards for their nuts and bolts, you know, and when I'm up in the air, I care about those too, right? right. And, but they care about that. And that's governance in terms of saying, this is how we want to, to do this. And the person who's the mechanic, maybe the one making the decision says this threshold is okay because it's been pushed down. You know, it, it exceeds by 1% versus 10% or whatever. But you're right that that's, that threshold's been pushed down or the decision-making, as long as it meets a threshold, it's good. And the same with CMDB or asset saying these types of CIs are in our CMDB. But all I was getting at on the airplane thought is that governance goes for every nut and bolt, how they test things. And it, it's because they, their purpose is for, we want to go fast, we want to go fast safely. Right. And, and you're absolutely right. I think that uh, that's, that's a very good analogy. Interesting. If you think about it, um, the alternative to, to governance in those situations is recovery from incidents. Yes. Which is painful. Right. Which is right. painful. So, exactly. So why did, if, if you really go back in, in, in the history of creating airplanes, for example, why do we have redundant systems? Why do we have heating systems around hydraulics? Why? Because somebody crashed. Yes. Right? Why do we have the icing on the, on the leading edges of wings? Because there was a, a famous uh, you know, air crash and people died as a result of that. And as, as, a, as a result of these incidents, we have learned to put in place governance which prevents those things from happening again. So, you know, I, I would say that an organization that relies on solving incidents to manage IT um, is, is not a very well governed, right? An organization that learns from incidents and applies proactive problem management is a well governed organization and their customers um, have just been working at a healthcare um, organization. You know, their customers will not die. Right. As a result of those, uh, you know, incidents happening because they have been prevented. How have they been prevented? By practicing good governance. Is it a hierarchical organization? Actually, no. This organization is, 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 is very lean, very spread out and, 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 and embraces a lot of the, uh, of the modern governance practices and a lot, of the, a lot of the modern working methods. Yet, they are very well governed, not because HIPAA said so, but because, uh, for those listening, HIPAA is the regulation which talks about privacy of information, et cetera, et cetera, um, and, and, and controls of, uh, of medical information and equipment and, and so on. Um, they don't have good governance because they are compliant to HIPAA. They have good governance because they know that if they don't, people are going to die. Right. Right. They're uh, compliant because they have good governance. They're not, they're, it's not exactly, the other way around, right? Exactly, exactly. And, uh, you know, to be honest, I went through this entire organization um, talking with them about how they manage IT and what their priorities are and so on. And not one of them said our priority is like HIPAA compliance. When I specifically raised it, they said, of course, it's HIPAA compliant because we practice good governance. It's kind of, you're absolutely right. They're compliant because they're good at what they do. They're not good at what they do because they comply. Exactly. Yeah, it's exactly. And the reason I threw that in about the CMDB is I see companies that take on too much scope. They yeah. see companies that that don't do things well and then, then broaden out, or they don't have a policy that says, every asset on the network has to be in our asset database, right? right? Those are governance capabilities that allow security, that allow speed, that allow for different capabilities. And that's the only reason I threw that in there was, you know, we still see that in the ITSM world as well. All changes must go through change enablement or change management, just so we, as a company, we understand what changes are happening to the organization. Stuff like that, right? Yeah. Does that mean every change goes to a cab? No. Absolutely not. Right. <laughs> it is and not I'm good all, governance. <laughs> I'm all for it because th there's this bureaucracy governance balance, yeah. right? Right. And I'm all for, if you have an organization that wants to go fast, set up a daily cab for just that organization. It takes five minutes. You're able to allow them to deploy daily. 
I'm all for whatever makes yeah. sense. The other thing I want to throw in with ITIL 4, if I may, and get your perspective. I think it encourages, V3 took a step, but 4 takes, encourages us to look, I want to say outside in. Let's look at how we deliver services from our customer's viewpoint. Let's make sure we're delivering the right services. We're governing them from their point of view versus the historical IT paradigm, which is, yes, I, del I developed in blue. Oh, Mr. Customer, Miss Customer, you want it in green? Well, here it is in blue. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so I think it, I tell four, whether, you know, you talk about the guiding principles or something else, it allows us to take an outside in view. Yeah, it absolutely does. Uh, I, I, I totally agree with that. And so that's just my view that, and I think that's coming. So yeah. we talked about strategy before, and you're one of the authors. So I would be remiss if I did not go down the, the IT strategy as it applies to ITIL 4, go down that path a little bit. So how did ITIL 4 incorporate strategy? And you can go any which way you want to a strategy in new ways or build upon old ways? How did ITIL 4 approach that? So the, the, I think the biggest, the biggest difference was if you look at version three, which was really the first time, actually it was a reference to strategy in version two, but it was really built out in version three. And to be honest, nobody really knew what we meant by a service strategy. Nobody really knew what to put in there uh, and what it would look like. And uh, we, we kind of had some loose ideas and um, you know, it, it, the, the book was written, uh, the first edition in 2007, uh, was written just with a, uh, you know, by, by two people, uh, Marjorie Iqbal and uh, Michael Nevis, who, who had a perspective uh, coming partly out of academic and partly out of the consulting world on what strategy would look like. And they wrote that book. Um, it was the first time that we actually had not an IT strategy book, but a service strategy book um, out there that we could kind of benchmark. Well, immediately we saw a bunch of things that, uh, that needed to be uh, written, uh, changed, uh, moved, added, and so on. By 2011, we had the next edition of that book. Even that, though, was, uh, I think it was, it was a product of its time. Uh, and I, I, I wrote that revision. And uh, I wrote it based on an organization that works with strategy on as sort of as an annual um, uh, process of creating strategy, reviewing strategy, creating your strategy for the next year or the next five years and so on and so forth. And it was very much around that sort of annual review cycle. It was also very much around the service component of an IT strategy. So it was a subset of a subset of strategy, and uh, it it was great. It, it you know it, it it focused on things like how do you define services and how do you keep a portfolio so that you can check on the investment in services over time and what their return is. Um, it introduced a bunch of really good uh, concepts uh, in two thousand seven and then refined in two thousand eleven. So really really good concepts. However, the world immediately began to change. Yes. And, you know, we start going into a cloud starts becoming a mainstream, uh, not only sourcing mechanism, but also a mechanism whereby people do business, right? It's not just, oh, well, well, we'll use it to replace servers in the back office. No, we'll actually use it to replace our systems of engagement with our customers, you know, and, and, and so cloud becomes this, this, the, this big thing. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we in the cloud, we have this capability to develop in very, develop, test and deploy very quickly. Yes. And we also have a whole range of new technologies hitting us, AI, machine learning, you know, all, all kinds of advanced intelligent automation. It's, it's amazing, but it's coming so quickly and social media starts taking off. So everything we do has to be with social media in mind. And it changes the entire organization, it changes the rules for business. So I'd written a book, which was for the way business used to be done. And now suddenly business has changed. And it's not just IT, it's the whole of business. And so the biggest difference, that long story to get to this one point, the biggest difference in four is that strategy is written from the point of view of business strategy, not IT strategy. And it says strategy by default today 
has to incorporate the digital world to some degree. Those who, in, who base their, their business, you know, 100% on digital, the digital strategy and the business strategy is the same strategy. Exactly. Those who base 25% of their business on a digital technology will have a digital strategy within their business strategy, not within their IT strategy, but within right. their business strategy, right? Mm -hmm. And the IT strategy is a part of your digital strategy. So it's very, very different. So we really wrote the digital and IT strategy book from the point of view of business strategy rather than IT strategy. And the whole idea was, let's write it for people who are IT leaders, who now find themselves being involved in defining and implementing business strategies and strategic initiatives. But let's also keep in mind that a number of these audience, a uh, number of the people who would potentially read these books are business people who have suddenly found themselves faced with the task of having to manage technology because it's embedded in their business unit. It's not, it's not an IT manager, uh, you know, on a service catalog anymore. You know, I, it, it's, it's here, it's live, it's in my business unit and I'm responsible for it. How do we equip those people to think strategically about managing uh, a digital technology and information technology? So I think at a high level, that, is the, that really uh, is the difference between version three and ICL four in terms of how we thought about strategy. And I would, I'm gonna pile on two different things if I may. One of the things I see that is tough for me to stomach too much in some organization is the lack of alignment between IT strategy and business strategy. Yes. Where IT is like, well, we have these roadmaps. We created them last year. Uh, and so I always think there's recalibration that always needs to happen, you know, like, because we need to shift resources from wherever they are to what's important, right? The right. resources should match what's important, whatever that means. But the second part is strategy is difficult for organizations because they they read about it, they can they think they know what it means, but it's hard for them to now see that as outcomes. And I think that's what ITIL 4 helps them do is say, this strategy should lead to these outcomes. And I know I left out a lot in between. But I, that's how I see it. Do you, do you disagree I, with that? No, I agree. And, and let me give you an example. I was uh, at a conference a, a few weeks ago. One of the first on-site, in-person conferences was great. We got together, sat in an audience. And at this conference was a roundtable of five CIOs from local organizations here in Dallas. And the, the, the whole theme was around digitals, uh, you know, digital and humans. And what is the perspective? What are the trends? And so what is a very high level CIO type conversation? But what was really interesting for me is four of the CIOs, and I won't mention any companies, but four of the CIOs had the same approach. Well, we need to get data to individuals and we need them to be able to collaborate. So what we're going to do is we're going to focus on a data sourcing integration strategy and focus on how we get data to those users. Okay. The fifth CIO said, I am the CIO in an ice manufacturing company. I worry about one thing and one thing only. How much ice is left in the freezer at every store in the region that we serve? And how can I get it refilled when it needs to be refilled so we don't waste money? Right? Now, yes. those are two strategic positions. The one is focused on building a data strategy. And you can bet that those organizations will have a magnificent data strategy. It will get data to users as quickly and as cleanly as it possibly can. Will it get the right data to them? It'll probably get way more data than they need. So it'll be really expensive. Yes. But hey, it'll be data to them. Yes. And you have a different strategy which says, you know what? I know we're going to need data, but here's what we need it for. And I can boil this down to five things. Internet of Things devices in fridges, right. monitoring and response, real-time rerouting of, uh, you know, tracking of where our delivery trucks are and rerouting them as we need to. Manufacturing forecasts based on where the ice is being used and how, and how quickly it's being used in real time. There's, no, no, 
which strategy is clear? Right. <laughs> which strategy is going to achieve the outcomes that you need to achieve? And, and bear in mind, this was the CIO, not, not the CEO, not the chief operating officer. This was the CIO. Um, and, and that, to me, really encapsulated the difference between uh, people who think of strategy from the point of view of the capabilities that they provide versus strategy as here's the direction we need to go. Here's the outcomes we need to achieve. How do we do this? What's the best way of doing this? Yeah. Right. And outcomes is, is how we all think, right? I mean, you know, I, if I spill something on this sport coat, I take it to the cleaners because I yeah. want an outcome. I really don't care about their processes. In fact, I probably don't want to know their processes. I just care about that service and having that outcome at a price that I know up front and am comfortable with and the timetable of expectation. And I think of that with strategy from a CIO's point of view. We just care about what outcomes, what's the cost, what's the timetable, how do we measure it, right? Because if I'm a dry cleaner, I want to I want to measure my time to service so I right. you know give people accurate uh, um, expectations on cost and timing. But to me, that that's we make it more complicated, David. We 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 really do, and I, I think one of the traps that we fall into very often is thinking that strategy only belongs to a certain group in the yes. organization, like architects and C level. Yep. And the rest of us, we're not interested in strategy. We're not involved in strategy. Actually, you're involved in strategy every single day. And, you know, I, I think of it, the best way I think of it just personally is that everything I do, every, every time, everything I do that involves a decision is strategic. Yes. So, you know, um, I am, you know, I'm going to go to a Mavericks game, right? That's my goal. That's my vision. I'm going to go to that Mavericks game. I'm going to arrive early and I'm going to get good seats and, you know, I've got my tickets and so on. Um, along the way, things change. Yeah. So I start implementing my strategic initiative, which is I get in the car and I start driving there. Well, it turns out that there are roadworks on the way or a major accident and now all the roads are blocked. What do you do? Right. right. Do you maintain your original strategic direction? Am I still going to go and see the Mavericks? Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, that's the local basketball team here in here in Dallas. Um, I would have said Cowboys, but we're a little bit shy about using that reference. But um, <laughs> so yeah, you know, do do I still am I still going to be able to make that Mavericks game? If I am, what's the alternative way of getting there? Right. If I'm not, because I know it's going to be too late no matter what, and I'm going to walk in there and it's, you know, it's like I'm going to miss out on the whole experience. Uh, what's the alternative? Do I turn around and go home? Do I decide to go to a movie? And every one of those decisions involves another action plan or another set of strategic initiatives, right? right. And so every time that you're making a decision, you may be the supervisor at a help desk and your, your strategy may be, you know, I want to, you know, I want to be, I want to improve my customer satisfaction. It's a strategy. How are you going to do that? And if it starts working, what do you do next? And if it doesn't work, what is the alternative? Right. right? These are all strategic and you use strategic thinking to get to the answers that you're looking for. And so for me, strategic, uh, you know, strategy, I was going to say strategery. Um, <laughs> strategy is, um, you know, is, is a fundamental component of the way we as human beings think how you apply it and what level in the organization, well, that just depends on where you happen to be. Right. And, and the other thing is, I want to pitch in on something, then I'll kick you another question. But I think that even if you have a group that, oh, they're the smart ones, they're developing strategy, they still need feedback from others within the organization. Yeah. Strategy is, is a cumulative based upon feedback process. And I say process because you need recalibration all the time, measurement, recalibration, saying, and I use this one example all the time, David, probably too much for my podcast listeners. If I'm on the East Coast and I want to, and I'm in a boat and I want to go to Europe, okay, I set forth and I go East from the East Coast of the US over to Europe. And I'm off by one degree. For every mile I go, I get off course by 92 feet. 92.2 feet. 
So now if I multiply this times going across the, only one degree, mind you, just one, I may, if, if it's now three or four or five degrees, because they get compounded over time, I might miss Europe. I might hit Africa and not be off by very much. And that's the same thing how I see it with our strategy. If we don't recalibrate and say, oh, we need to alter a little bit this way, recalibrate, oh, we need to go this way. And right. so is that exactly is that fair? That is that is uh, totally fair, and it's it's something that we've really talked about a lot in the, in the in the ITIL four book, which is there are three layers of measurement within strategy. One is, are the initiatives that I've implemented are they on track to budget to spec? Are they achieving what they're supposed to achieve? Two, is my strategy still on track? So yes, I may be achieving my objectives, but are they having the desired effect? Are they actually taking me where I need to go? And three. Is my strategy still valid within the context of the organization? You know, I may have made a decision that we're, you know, we're going to head in this direction. Then suddenly there's a pandemic, right? You're not going to keep heading in that direction. You're going to change everything, right? right. And so there's these three layers of metric. And you have to continuously evaluate where you are in relation to the, into your context internally and externally. So that's exactly right. Um, no, you know, this is nothing new. This is not a new concept by any means. This, this has been around. Uh, in fact, if you go into financial or cost accounting uh, books, which I had to do, unfortunately, but there is something called budget deviation analysis. Mm -hmm. Now, budget deviation, uh, budget deviation analysis simply says you're going to spend X amount to achieve Y objective. If you find that you're achieving Y plus 15%, you can expect your expense to go up. Right. right? Therefore, your budget has to deviate. You have to, you have to go with it. Right? Instead, what we see happening is organizations say, well, the budget is $100,000 and $100,000 is what it is. You can't go above that. Yeah, but if we spend 120, we can actually make $3 million more. No, no, that's your budget. <laughs> it happens. No, it yeah. happens. We get in that sunk cost theory of, yeah. all right, I, I went and I begged for this hundred grand and I'm not, they told me never to come back, you know. Exactly. And exactly. so we just sunk cost into our thought. Yeah. I have one yeah. question for you on strategy. And this is kind of a, a doozy since we're talking strategy and it's, it's put into uh, outcomes. Sometimes leaders get in this reactive strategy mode. And which kind of sounds like, uh, you know, how can you be reactive and strategic at the same time? But we'll leave that there. But how, you know, what does proactive strategy look like? How can we shift our focus to that proactive side versus that reactive side if we're stuck there? Right. So it, it, it depends who you are and where you're sitting in the organization. Let's assume we're talking about IT managers, uh, IT leaders at this point. The best way, uh, sorry, let's talk about reactive first. The reactive strategy is easily identified. Reactive strategy equals the sum of your projects. Mm -hmm. so if you take your project portfolio and you look at what you're busy working on, that's your strategy right there. So in other words, all you're doing is you're responding to business demand. Somebody comes up with a need, they articulate that need in a project proposal, the project proposal gets approved and you implement it, that is reactive strategy. What ends up with, what you end up with is something that I saw in, in a strategy is stratified strategy. So basically the first one that they developed was in um, 83. That is a business critical system and it is still managed and, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, uh, provisioned in exactly the same way as it was in 83, much more expensive now because we rely on COBOL programmers in a mainframe. The next layer was the next major layer of development was done in the early 90s. That's all on client server. And there it sits. And so you have these stratifications of strategy and they're kind of frozen in time. Yes. Right. So, so that's how you can see you have a reactive strategy. Now, in terms of proactive strategy, there is really the best way to start becoming reactive. It's not an overnight thing, but the best way to start becoming proactive is to get out into the business. Yes. And, you know, somebody's going to say, well, what is the business? Find somebody 
at your level or above, who has profit and loss responsibility? That's the business, right? Go and sit down with them. Ask them. Explain your job to me. Explain the frustrations that you have. Explain what you're trying to achieve this year. What are you trying to achieve over the next five years? Get to understand it. You cannot be. You cannot start to be proactive unless you have that understanding. And so, and and even that process, by the way, just getting to know these business leaders is going to take you another year. Yes. And so, before you start defining proactive strategies and so on and so forth, spend a year. Get to know peers in the business. It, it, it's uh, becoming more and more true. This is just a slight aside. More and more true that in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, uh, you could be an IT guy or IT girl uh, in any organization, and you can move from one organization to another. Today, if you're an IT person in a bank, you're going to need to understand so much about the banking business that it's, you know, you're probably going to stay in banking for the, for the rest of your career. Right. Because it is so specialized. And so what I'm saying there is that if you want to be proactive, you really have to be, uh, you know, um, immersed in the understanding of the business. You have to understand how they talk about value, how they measure value, quality, etc. That's the first step. I don't know if we, you know, if we, if, if we can even get to the second step from there. But the second step is, is really just, you know, asking the what if questions. And in IT, our what if questions are based on what the vendors are telling us is coming along next. <laughs> yes. Right? In the business, it's all about what new markets are we looking for? What new products can we develop? Now, in, in, in a digital technology perspective, that discussion is if this new digital technology could be deployed, what new business opportunities would it create? Could we develop new products, new services? Could we de deliver and develop products and services that we do today, but differently, better, uh, more quickly? Uh, are there new markets that we can enter? And, and so when you're starting to think about that, and you're starting to think about the business environment, you automatically start becoming more and more proactive because you're in the front line of, bus of business decision-making rather than just responding to a need that somebody expressed through a project plan. That's always going to be behind. And that's the one thing I was going to say is by the time that's delivered, and I don't even care what framework we're talking about, you know, how whenever that's delivered, it's probably going to be out of date. And the, my best example for this, David, is a year ago, January. So January of 2020, there were companies that had a year long project plan for to deliver something. And then the pandemic hit. And they could not alter course. They could not, all they could do is either go, no go decisions. You know, do we move forward or do we just shut her down? And I would just say, no, your, your strategy just took a left turn and we need to make a left turn with it. And, you know, we need to have that trust with those, those consumers and stakeholders and say, hey, what is it you need from us to be able to have capabilities so you can do X better? You yeah. know, help me help me understand what you're trying to do. Let's have this trust so that, you know, that you can tell me without fear of whatever that, that we can help deliver what you are, you know, will be equipped to be able to deliver when you get there to understand right. your roadmap. Exactly. And I, I think you mentioned the pandemic and I, I just think of restaurants in my neighborhood as mm -hmm. really good examples of proactive versus reactive. And of course, every strategy in a pandemic was to some extent reactive, but yes. But think about the two different types. Uh, the restaurant right across the road from me, um, you know, standard American food, burgers, uh, steaks, ribs, you know, the whole thing, really good, really good food, beer, always busy. First week of the pandemic, they closed their doors. Let's wait and see what happened, they said. <laughs> well, what happened is they went out of business and they're still out of business, they never reopened. Restaurant around the corner, little Middle Eastern restaurant, well known for having hookers outside the front door. Henry's the guy's name, I, uh, the, 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 the manager of the restaurant. Henry looked at this and said, uh, I don't know what to do. I've got to stay open. I've got to stay open. But I don't know what this business is going to look like in a month's time. So what can I do? 
realized that he's, you know, at least a significant part of his business was people coming and smoking the hookers outside his restaurant, <laughs> went around to the local apartments and said, if anybody wants to rent a hooker, I'll give you the equipment for free. All you have to do is buy your charcoal and whatever it is they put in those things. I don't know. Come and get them from me. I'll, you know, I'll hook you up. And, and he kept his business going on supplying the local hooker users. Right. Um, when you say hooker, uh, hooker. Stop. Hooker. <laughs> yeah. I just want to make sure, you know, we're not promoting. It was, it was the smoking uh, thing. Yeah. You know, I just want to make sure there. we are, we're, 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 yeah. we're talking. And, and invariably, what would happen is people would come and pick up their supplies and they would get a bottle of wine because, of yeah. course, there was, there was uh, they were licensed to do that. And a few of them would say, hey, I, you know, give me something to eat as well. He kept his business going by shifting the focus and, you know, that left turn that, that you talked about. Um, and today, uh, you know, because of the loyalty that he won of those customers, uh, the very first chance that was open, you could not get into that place. Places around were kind of half empty, people wondering, do I go there or not? How safe is it? But Henry's place was absolutely jam packed because he had built that loyal following through a really difficult time. He had changed his strategy. He'd been proactive thinking, I don't know what's coming, but I have to change. I'm going to try and think one step ahead. And sometimes I'll get it right. And sometimes I won't. Poor Henry, you know, one of his other great ideas was I'm going to put a, you know, I'm going to put one of those tents outside, you know, one of those uh, canopy things. Mm -hmm. And I'm going get, get, to get a camel. And I'm going to put that out there and people will come and see the camel. Um, but they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's one of those things that, you know, I've seen organizations succeed or fail because restaurants, because of the quality of their app, you know, that they use for right. you to be able to order food to pick it up. Or, you know what I'm saying? Like, yep. what's really interesting in the city I live, that the downtown area, is, is pretty much a ghost town and those restaurants are really struggling. But all that restaurant business has shifted outward to where people live yeah. because now people are working from home. That's right. And these restaurant chains, don't ask me why they didn't figure this out, but could not reassign their resources, you know, and say, let's figure out how to maximize if people are gonna order where they live, not where they work, then we have to change our strategy to adapt towards that. Yeah, yeah, no, no, exactly. And it, it, is, it is surprising in many cases, as you say, inability of people to reassign resources. And the reason for that is because people want to hold on to the existing strategy. Yes. And that's what the first restaurant did. We, we can't pivot with this. So we're gonna to stick to what we do because we know how to do it and just wait until things get back to normal. And they didn't, so they didn't. It will never be normal again. I don't mean that in a bad again. way, but no, you know what I mean? Like we're living yeah. in a time that we can't even predict what next year, or the year after will look like much less, but we're not going to turn back the dial to where we were right. in 2019. Right. Which is why, you know, to get back to the Eitel book is, is uh, we started talking about the, the shortening of, uh, of strategic cycles or strategy yes. planning cycles. And that we're now in a period where the average strategy planning cycle is less than six months and probably even less than three months in many organizations and until you know until we're in a more stable environment um but it basically means uh, and, and again you're in an agile working environment and you have to work in an agile manner yes uh and you you cannot afford to take this approach that this is the way we've always done it this is the way our processes work and so that's how we're going to continue you have to continuously review everything keep making changes not huge changes but changes that help you to flex with the way in which your organization needs to change right yeah. and i see that in every business especially as technology becomes more at the fore right and so you and i could talk all day and i appreciate your hour plus david so if the audience says this David guy is really sharp, which you are, <laughs> and I want to get in touch with him because he does consulting and my organization could use him. How could the audience get in touch with you, David? So the, the, you know, honestly, uh, we've tried many different ways. The best and easiest way is just LinkedIn. Just get onto LinkedIn. I'm on there. And uh, 
if you click on contact details, you'll find my email address in there, uh, or just shoot me a just shoot me a quick message. Connect with me. Uh, always happy to always happy to meet new people or renew acquaintances with some people I've known for years. That's awesome. And you announced this past week that you are uh, speaking at the Pink Conference coming up in February, right? Uh, that is correct. I am. And we're going to be talking about uh, digital and IT strategy at that conference. And uh, I hope and believe that you will be there too. So we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> and uh, I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to it. Just I think we're all going to be like so excited to get out of the house and get out and all that sort of thing. So it doesn't take much to get me excited anyway, but that really <laughs> doesn't, you know, because I enjoy this show. So we talk shop with people all different walks of life all different industries and you know the one thing about it is the sense of community it's what we all yearn for right. and that pink conference will be great for that absolutely and i'm really looking forward to it and uh they always put on a really good conference and uh always relevant uh good people uh actually service management people are just wonderful yes. people in general but yeah looking forward to getting together with uh with folk there yeah me too well, David, thank you for joining us, and uh, we'll, we'll have you on very soon again. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Jeffrey. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Thank you.